Well, good morning, church, if you're able. If you're able, please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. Uh, This morning we'll be reading in Judges chapter 13. And if you're using the Bible in the seat in front of you, that's on page 251. And if you do not own a Bible, that is our gift to you today. So Judges chapter 13, we'll read verses 1 through 7. And it starts with a familiar phrase. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. There was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not borne children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, A man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of an angel of God, very awesome. And I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name, but he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. And may God bless the reading and our hearing of his word. You may be seated. Well, again, good morning, church. My name is Dave. If you don't know me, I'm one of the elders here at uh, Mill Creek Community Church and want to welcome you here. Uh, If you do happen to be new or visiting, uh, we would ask that you would stop by our Welcome Center in the foyer. Uh, We have a gift for you, and it would let you know who we are, uh, what we're about here at Mill Creek, and a a way to connect with you. Um, Speaking of connection, if you would take that connection card for those of us who are uh, even members, regular attenders, and so on, fill that out. Let us know you're here. Uh, And certainly add any praises, any prayer requests, so that we can uh, certainly connect with you on those and uh, be praying for you uh, in in whatever means you would ask us to. Uh, You can drop those in any of the offering boxes uh, by the exit doors. Um, Your welcome, excuse me, your worship guide uh, that you were given uh, has some few, uh, a few announcements here. Uh, again, if you are new, there's some information on the back of who we are. Uh, but more importantly, the, um, the announcements, I'll just run through a, f- uh, a few of these with you. Uh, April 7th, which is Good Friday, uh, we have, we're offering a Good Friday service. Now, we haven't done this in, in many, many years. Uh, I'm not even sure the last time we have, but... Um, we're, we are looking forward to being able to offer that. Um, so please note the time of that. Note, note that it's one service and there is no child care. Uh, but that is going to be available on Good Friday, um, April 7th at 4.30. Of course, Easter Sunday, we'll have our two services to celebrate uh, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Uh, so that'll be exciting. And then April 16th, the following Sunday, is... Uh, baptism Sunday, so we will be doing baptisms. If you're interested in that, if that's something uh, that you've been thinking about, you want to go public and proclaim your faith, uh, please let us know that. Indicate that on that card, and we would love to connect with you ahead of time on that and talk through that with you. Lastly, there's a map on the screen here. Now, you're the second service, so it doesn't matter, okay? But, but if you happen to attend the first service, uh, even next week or the week after, uh, this is what we're emphasizing is the, if, you, if you're at first service, exit out this side, nearest the funeral home, 
and it's that's been helpful to for the tra- uh, with traffic flow and and so on. So, if you'd be mindful of that, uh, before I pray, uh, it, just to m- I'll mention it is Communion Sunday, and so we have a, a actually a couple of special treats today. I think uh, number one, uh, Vit- our brother Vitali is going to preach the word to us today. So we're looking forward to him bringing that word and, and how he studies the word and, and brings it to us. We are so looking forward to that. Uh, and then at the, the close of the service, Pastor Brandon will come up and serve communion. Uh, so we get two special treats, a, a, something a little bit different. Now with regard to communion, I want to point out to everyone, uh, this is the first Sunday we're using new cups. So please be mindful. If you're like me, I'm a creature of habit, I just start pulling that, that top tab and now the juice is open. Well, these cups, there's a tab for the bottom where the cracker is and then you'd flip it over and have the... And I was made fun of because I, I gave such great uh, instruction the first service and I did it right, but for some reason I had juice all over my hands. Uh, so I'm not sure how that happened, but... Um, it just goes to show you that you don't have to be special to take communion, just part of the uh, Lord's family. So uh, if you would pray with me. Father, Lord, we are grateful for you, for your word, and how your spirit uh, illuminates that to us. Lord, I pray your blessings on our time today. I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to your word uh, that you will deliver through our beloved brother and your faithful servant, Vitaly. Uh, Lord, give him joy through the process of bringing your word to us. Feed your sheep through him and, and bless him in that. Uh, Lord, we love you. We pray that all that we do here honors and glorifies your name. And it's in that name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. It's always an honor and privilege to open God's word before you today. During the first service, I said that I don't think I've ever preached from the book of Judges before. I don't think I can say that again. I've done it, uh, but it doesn't make it easier. So uh, when, when we study the book of Judges, what an interesting book. It really reminds me of a lenticular picture. I don't know if you ever, you, you've seen those before. We have a picture of a screen of this butterfly. Maybe you, you had a, uh, a notebook before like that. I used to have a ruler that has a couple of pictures on there, and if you turn it, it would change the picture. And that's what I think of when I read the book of Judges. On the one hand, on the, from the one point of view, this book is so frustrating. People are sinful. People are offensive to God. They're rebelling against the God, falling into the idolatry. But if you look at from the different perspective, you see the grace of God. You see the awesomeness of God, you see the mercy of God. And as we come to the chapter 13, we come to the 12th judge, or a sixth major judge. His name is Samson. Very, very famous judge. And uh, if some of the judges got only one verse from the Bible, he got four chapters. That's four out of 21. He is so famous, he probably made into most of the children's Bibles. If you say Samson, that name in itself already is being associated with strength and power. If you call a kid, you little Samson, you mean you're a really strong kid. And he was great. His greatness we see is starting before he's even born. But he is one judge who did not deliver Israel. Today we won't be talking about Samson's life which you find out will be filled with lust and selfishness. We won't be talking about his strength, which is what he's known for. This chapter talks about the will of God for Samson and his parents. This chapter talks about the state where Israelites are at. But most importantly, I think this chapter talks about the heart of God. As I've been uh, studying this passage, as I've been studying this chapter the one main idea that was impressed on my heart was the faithfulness of God to His promises, faithfulness of God to His covenant, faithfulness of God despite of unfaithfulness of man. And the first truth we see in this chapter is that first God shows His faithfulness 
through his intervention. We see God's intervention starting from verse 1. We, we read that the people of Israel did again what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They were on this downward spiral of sin, idolatry, rebellion against God, which followed by punishment, wars, oppression, which followed by people crying out to God, asking for help, seeking Him, and God in His grace intervenes by sending a deliverer who would save them, and then they have peace, but for, for a short time. Then the next chapter we go to, then we go to the next generation, we start that cycle again. Wash, rinse, repeat. So frustrating. But in this cycle, something is different. People are in sin, they're in idolatry, they're being oppressed, but nobody's crying out to God. They've been oppressed for 40 years and nobody's seeking the Lord. But God still shows His faithfulness and He sends a deliverer. He intervenes. We read that these people were in the hand of the Philistines. The Philistines, we learned from the ancient history, that they were one of the groups from the sea peoples. That's what they call them. Or Egyptians called them foreigners of the sea. They were coming from the area where the Greece is at, down by the sea or around by the land, destroying everything on the way. And they were trying to invade Egypt, but Egyptian army were able to push them out, so they had to retreat, go back to the lands that they conquered earlier. One of the lands was Canaan. That's where they lived, and in the place where they destroyed the city, they would build a city more and more uh, fortified, stronger, more uh, logical how they would build everything there. They also brought agriculture to the indigenous people who used to live there. They brought um, pottery, gods, which we find out that Israel, Israelites were worshiping themselves. They also brought some customs and language, but most importantly, I think they brought in metallurgy. They knew and understood the chemistry and physics of metals. They knew how to work with metals, how to mine the metals. They were able to build some quality tools, some quality weapons, and you can guess that it was a big deal back in the day. That gave them power, that gave them strength. Maybe it was one of the reasons why they could even afford trying to uh, invade Egypt. They had weapons and they knew how to use them, but only because God allowed them to. In Judges uh, chapter 3, if you could turn with me there, I want to read these four verses with you. Judges chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now these are the nations that the Lord had left to test Israel by them. That is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war to teach war to those who had not known it before. These are the nations, the five lords of Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites who lived in Mount Lebanon, the Mount Baal Hermon, and as far as Lebo Hamath. They were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. God left this powerful nation, Philistines, to stay only to test Israelites. And we learn from this book that Israelites failed again. Instead of keeping the law, instead of obeying God's commandments, they forgot their covenant God. Instead of destroying the idols of those lands, they worshipped them. Instead of being separated to God, instead of being holy to God, they became just like every other nation around them. They became pagans. They were comfortable with sin. They were corrupt, not just corrupt, they were progressively corrupt. With every chapter, with every generation, they were getting worse and worse. And the Word says that this 
they did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. It was evil. They were comfortable. The nation that they lived in was comfortable. The culture said what they're doing is okay. It was acceptable, but it was not acceptable to God. They rebelled against God, so the Lord gave them up for 40 years. He chose them to be holy, but they chose to be like everyone else around them. Why so severe? 40 years, that's a long time. That's the amount of time they spend in the desert. That's twice as long as they've been in oppression under Deborah and Barak uh, leadership. But if you think about God, covenant God who they are in relationship, they offended him. Do you realize that your sins are offensive to God? Do you realize that sins violate our relationship with God? Because of sins, we were separated from God. Think of Adam and Eve. They could not stay in the Garden of Eden because they did not obey. They had to be cast out from the presence of God because we have sinned. The infinitely holy God, we deserve infinite separation from Him. I try to explain to my children that their disobedience is offensive to me. Now, they get confused. They say, well, what does your feelings have to do with dirty dishes? What does your feelings have to do with my dirty room or unvacuumed floors? Well, I try to tell them, you chose not to listen to me. You chose to do something you thought was right. You disrespected me. You were offensive to me. That's hurtful. When I said that, I was thinking, I wonder if that's how God feels about my sin. My sin is offensive to God. My sin is insulting to Him. It's hurtful to the covenant God. Do you realize that God takes your sin personally? Now, He dealt with that, and that's what we're celebrating today, but it caused them His Son. Even when you think you're not hurting anyone, remember that you're hurting God. Israelites again sinned and offended their covenant God, and He gave them, gave them up but not forever. He's gracious. He intervenes because he's faithful and he does something extraordinary to a family that cannot bear children. Verse 2, it says, there was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of Danites. It's important to know that because Dan, Dan's uh, Danite fam tribe was close to Philistia. I have a map here on the screen that I wanted to show you. The map on the left shows you the region where each of the 12 tribes of Israel would to, used to live or live. The map on the right shows their influence during the different uh, timeline of the oppression. Those green circles, there's that as much of uh, influence they had. And you can see the Danites were so close to Philistia. What it's telling us is that God sends a deliverer next to the hottest zone on the map. He intervenes by speaking to this woman who is barren. Verse 3, the angel of the Lord appeared to a woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. He comes to a woman who is sterile. He comes to a woman who lives in disgrace. Back in that culture, having a family was an honorable thing. Having a lot of kids, that was, that was very honorable. People value that. They couldn't have any children. They lived in shame. It was disappointing. So this angel of the Lord brings great news to them that you will have a kid. You will have a son. And not just a son, but he will be a deliverer to this nation. Our friends... They're about our age. Got married about the same time my wife and I got married. They didn't have kids for 10 years. Been praying for them. And about a year ago, the lady calls my wife and says, Hey, listen, I'm expecting. I'm due in two months or so. Can you imagine? They got, they got a child. Their, their son is about a year old. 
They're excited. We're excited. My wife, Olia, calls me. Did you hear? They're going to have a kid. They're going to have a family. We don't even live in that society. We don't live, even live in that culture. But we get excited when we have kids in the families. Her shame was covered. The angel brought joy and grace to her. But isn't that something God done for us? He covered our shame. He gave us his grace. We have rebelled. Our part was sin, offense toward God. Our sin brought so many harmful consequences. Maybe you're thinking of some in your life. The sin that caused you financial issues, extra bills, sin that caused us health issues, broken relationships. But the Bible teaches that God covers our shame through His Son. He intervenes by sending His Son. And by faith in Him, He lifts up your disgrace. He covers your shame. He gives you honor and joy. He gives you new identity. You're a new creation. Sin brought Israelites shame and disgrace. But God intervenes and sends good news to Manoah's wife and says, you're going to have a deliverer. And it's unlikely birth. They can't have a child, but God is do doing something extraordinary. And we see that in the Bible, that every time God does something great, God does something extraordinary, we know that he's up to something. We know that he's going to do something great. Think of Sarah and Abraham not having children until they're 90 and 100. They have a child. Rebecca and Isaac, were, uh, Isaac's wife, was barren and gave uh, birth to Jacob and Esau. Rachel, Jacob's wife, was barren, gave birth to Joseph, who saved Israel from famine. Hannah couldn't have any children, but God gave her Samuel, who was the who was the person who uh, anointed Saul and David to be a kings. Zechariah and Elizabeth, they couldn't have kids, but God gave them uh, John the Baptist who prepared the way. And Jesus was born to a virgin Mary, the greatest deliverer of all. Every time we see this case of impossible birth, we know that God is fulfilling His promise by either preserving His people or delivering His people. And this is what we see in this passage where the angel comes in verse 4 and 3. He calls them, that it tells them that this, their son will be a Nazarite from birth until death. So in verse 6, the woman runs to her husband and she says, the woman came to and told her husband, a man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. His appearance was so awesome. In other words, it was so terrifying that she was afraid to ask who he is or where he was from. Now, she calls him a man of God, which means it's a title given to a prophet. So we knew he walked like a man, he talked like a man, he, he looked like a man. No wings, no halo, no levitating of the ground. But what she witnessed was terrifying because she witnessed something extraordinary. She witnessed God's intervention. She witnessed God's faithfulness to his promises. She witnessed his greatness. Second, we see in this passage, <clears throat> God shows his faithfulness by giving God's instruction. I, I love this. Verse 8, as soon as Manoah hears this, it says, Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come again to teach us. What we, what we are to do with a child who will be born. Manoah is seeking more instruction. Manoah is seeking God. Okay, I believe you. Great, I'm looking forward to, to it. But please, tell us what to do. 
And the great news in verse 9 and 10, we see that God heard his prayer and he sends the angel again. But the angel doesn't give him much information. Um, verse 12, Manoah said, Now when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life? What is his mission? In other words, what will be the judgment of young man and his work? He wants to know his calling, the calling of his son. Now, ever thought about this? If you had a chance to ask an angel just one question, what would it be? Probably something very important. Probably something you're very desperate about. Manoah wants to know what is the nature of his son's calling. How should we raise him up? Should he go to public school or private school? Now, when he grows up, should he go to Bible college or military? What kind of leader is he going to be? I mean, those are some valid questions. Some of you know that I was born in Russia, grew up in Ukraine, and lived most of my life here in Erie. Things that's happening in Ukraine right now, it's heartbreaking to me. But I was wondering, what would it be like if an angel would come to a young family and tell them, you're going to have a son who's going to be a deliverer, who's going to deliver this nation from the oppression. If you were that family, what, would you, what questions would you have? His questions are, give us more instruction. Please, tell, tell me more. What should I do? Verse 13, And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat anything that comes from the wine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink or eat anything unclean. All that I commanded, uh, commanded her, let her observe. So he pretty much said what I told her uh, earlier, just let her do that. On what, he, what he has told her in verse 4 was that her son needed to be Nazarite. In Nazarite, when somebody would take Nazarite vow, we learn from number six, they had to do three things. They, were not, uh, they should not cut their hair, even facial hair if you're a man. They cannot drink or eat anything from gripe, any grape product. They cannot have contact with that body, uh, even if it's something, you know, some, some of their relatives. They had to be ceremonially clean. It was a way for people to intensely look for God. It was a way for people to seek the Lord in the time of need. It was a way for them to be holy and devoted to the Lord. But the angel said, for him to be a Nazarite from the womb, you, his mother, need to take the vow yourself while you're pregnant. In order for this little deliverer to come, you yourself need to be devoted to the Lord. Your life have to be, has to be devoted to the Lord. Manoah was seeking for more instruc instructions, but the angel said, what you have is enough. All you, have, you, you don't need anything more. What you, what you need is you need faith. You need to trust the Lord. And we learn from Hebrews 11, 1, that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the assurance. It's the conviction. Our faith is not just a wishful thinking. Our faith is built on the conviction of God's Word. As we study the Word of God, we have faith because we have assurance that it's true, that His Word is sufficient, that His Word is enough. Manoah, Manoah wasn't happy with Angel's answer. He said, I want more. Give me more instructions. He said, no, you need to walk by faith. You need to be devoted to God yourself. Listen, we want our next generation to be devoted to the Lord. I want my boys more than anything else to be devoted to God. And I'm being reminded today that it is my call to be devoted to God myself. I need to seek Him. I need to be the example to my children. That's why he's teaching Manoah, you need to be devoted to Him yourself. 
you need to have faith and what I told you is enough. <laughs> he says, no, give me more. And I'm reminded of the Second Corinthians 12, 9, when uh, Apostle Paul prays for God to remove a certain thorn of flesh from his life. He said to me, we read, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. God tells Paul, what you have, what I have provided for you, the knowledge that you received from me, the help that you have received from me, that is enough. You don't need more. It is adequate. Church, if God is giving you ministry to do or a role to fulfill, you can know that it is enough. He gave you enough grace to fulfill that. He gives you enough grace to accomplish whatever task it is, even if it's parenting. He gave you enough to get your job done. But what you need to do is seek the Lord, be devoted to Him, and trust that what He has given us is sufficient. Maybe we don't need to worry about what school our kids are going to go to or what we're going to do tomorrow. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 34, Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. When he said, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, that was very encouraging to me yesterday I was, as I was getting ready to preach today. He's encouraging them and says, don't worry about that today. <clears throat> you need to trust the Lord. You need to submit your life to him. You don't need more information. You don't need more instructions. You don't need more rules. What you know is enough. What I gave you is enough. You have the Bible. You have the Word. Read the Word. Do the Bible study. Learn what the Bible says about anxiety. Learn what the Bible says about sin or parenting or uh, husband and wife, marriage, whatever it is. Seek the Lord. He already has revealed what's enough for us in His Word. Now, this is confusing. Think about this. Manoah prays for God to send this angel again to ask more questions. God answers his prayer. The angel comes, but he would not answer any of his questions. Then why did you come? Why did you come? Well, he came to show God's presence. Truth number three we see in this chapter is God shows his faithfulness by displaying his presence. In verse 16, Manoah tried to bribe this angel with Middle Eastern hospitality by offering him a goat, which he refused. Then he asks him for his name. It was another way of getting to this close relationship with, a, with somebody that you don't know. Verse 17 says, Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? So that when your words come true, we may honor you. He attempts again to get closer to this being and ask him something that he would offer and answer his questions. His response was unusual. Verse 18, the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. His name is wonderful? He's not giving him the name, but he's giving him the description of his name. It is wonderful. It's amazing. It's beyond understanding. It's something that you cannot grasp. We see similar expression in uh, Psalms 139, verse 6, where David says, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. The knowledge of his name the knowledge of God and what He does in our lives is just too much to grasp with our little puny minds. Then we see when God gave victory at the Red Sea to the Israelites, the Israelites exclaimed in Exodus 15, 11, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious, glorious deeds, doing wonders, Church, the God we serve, He is majestic, He is awesome, He is wonderful. 
He doesn't give them the name, but he gives them the description. He doesn't answer his questions, but he offers something greater. What he reveals to him is that this is not just an angel. This is a Yahweh himself. And a big theological word that I want to introduce to you is theophany. It has this word theo in there, which means God, like theology, the study of God. Theophany is the visible manifestation of God. It's, it's the appearance of God, which we see in the Old Testament in many different uh, ways. We see God revealing himself to his covenant people in, in the thunderstorm and burning bush, as a warrior, as a me messenger. But all those manifestations, they were temporary appearances of God pointing to the permanent appearance which was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. John 1, 14 says, And the Word, that's Christ, became flesh and dwelt among us. Some theologians say uh, this is Trinitarian mystery. And I'm just going to leave it there, okay? We're just going to stop with that. But we see that God, He wants to show that He is present and he's revealing himself on the mountain, Sinai, in the cloud, lighting and thunder. He's revealing himself to Isaiah as the one sitting on the, on the, uh, sitting on the throne. Thank you. He is the, he's appearing to Ezekiel with these strange creatures called cherubim. All of these only to point that we are serving God who is not distant. We're serving the one who is present. Yes, he's, he's so holy. Yes, he's so far, yet he's choosing to appear and be present in our life. And we have that through Christ, through Jesus. We have that through, the, through his spirit. Manoah's prayer was, uh, was answered, not the way he wanted to, but the way God answered that was to strengthen his faith. He answered it to teach him the fear of God or the awe of God. God answered Manoah's prayer to show him the presence of God in his life. And we see this brave Manoah's reaction here. Verse 22, Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. Now we know that he didn't die. Uh, his wife gave him a good theological lesson. And you can read that for yourself. But what we see in this passage is that Manoah didn't need more information. Manoah didn't need more instruction. What he needed was to see the presence of God. Church, we don't need more information. We don't need more rules, more instructions. What we need is to seek the Lord. What we need is to seek the presence of God through prayer every day, every moment of all, all our life by praying to Him and seeking Him, seeking His help. We need to seek His presence as we read the Word. One of the practices that I've been doing lately as I open the Word in my quiet time, I'm asking God, please show me Jesus. Because everything, this whole Bible is pointing to Him. I mean, information is good. It's good to know the cities and names and dates and all the things. It's useful. But knowing the name, knowing God, knowing the character of God, that's why we go to the Word to seek His presence. And this is the greatest fulfilled promise that we have. God becoming flesh. His presence has been revealed through Jesus. And even though Jesus may not be physically or visibly in this room right now, His Spirit is in us. His Spirit is here. The Spirit of Christ is dwelling in us if you have put your faith in Him, if you are in Christ. Think about this. Although we have sinned, although we have offended God, rebelled against God, holy, most holy God, and deserve the separation. He has sent His Son. He intervened to bring us to Himself. He sent His Son to take our sin, to pay the punishment that we deserve. 
that those who put their trust in him, that those who believe in his death and resurrection, that it is sufficient, will receive eternal life. They will receive the presence of God who will be dwelling in them, empowering them to live out uh, their Christian life. Spirit that guides us, strengthens us, comforts us, reminds us of the truth. Spirit that gives us the eternal life and gives, will give us resurrection. The question is, do you have eternal life? Do you have His Spirit living in you? If not, I'm asking you today to turn toward God today. Submit your life. Surrender your life to Him. Seek Him. Turn to Him. Become His follower. Believe that His sacrifice and resurrection is enough. God is faithful by giving us the most excellent deliverer who saves us, uh, saves us from the sins. The deliverer who restores broken relationships with the Father. And this is what we celebrate today. Let's pray, church. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your presence in our lives. Thank you for interfering and uh, bringing us to, to know Christ and saving us from our sins, giving us the new life we have in Jesus. I pray, Lord, for those who don't know you yet, that they would put their trust in you today. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we uh, continue in that spirit of what Vitaly has already said, um, we have an opportunity to respond to God's word. We get to respond in, in worship. We're going to sing. But we get to respond in worship by celebrating communion and what it means for us as believers. As Vitaly pointed out at the end there, we long for a deliverer. We long for someone to save us and to deliver us from our greatest problem, which is our sin. And God provided that person in Jesus. He sent him to deliver us. So as we celebrate communion, we remember that. And that's a, it's an important concept of communion is that we are called to remember Christ's death and his sacrifice. See, the problem with uh, the book of Judges is that they keep going through this cycle, and the onset of the cycle comes when they forget who God is, and they lean on their idols, they lean on themselves. Today, and once a month, we celebrate communion so that we remember who God is, we remember what he's done for us. So we're about to sing a song in a moment here. Uh, it's a song that I want to introduce for this Easter time. It's a, it's a wonderful song about the cross. It's called Because of Christ. And the chorus of that song goes like this. It says, may I never boast in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ. May I not forget, there it is, that remembrance. May I not forget the blood that he shed for me. It's by his death that I'm alive. Because of Christ, I am alive. Again, the song is going to call us to remember. What we know to be true about communion is this. It's a special time for believers. And what we offer here at our church is that, that communion is there and it's available for anybody who is in right relationship with the Lord, walking with him and has a, has a relationship with him. What we're doing is we're celebrating what God has done for us. If that's not you today, then we just ask that you just leave the communion where it's at and we're going to have a time of reflection. We would encourage you to, to pray and surrender your life to the Lord so that you can have a relationship with him. You can celebrate what he has accomplished for you on the cross. But as we do that, I just want to remind us of why this next section is important for us. In 1 Corinthians 11, the, the famous chapter on, on communion, we read verses 23 through 26. It talks about how we take communion. But in verses 27 through 29, it talks about the heart that we need to have as we do that. Let me read verse 27 for you. It says, Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. The encouragement there and what this next moment is for us is for us to just pause, to pray, to reflect, to examine, and to discern 
how great the sacrifice was for us that Jesus shed his blood in our place and for our sins. So as the worship team plays, take some time and pray. Take some time and examine yourself. Prepare yourself for this important symbol of communion. And then Gil will ask us to sing. If you reach down in the chair in front of you, there's communion cups. And as Dave, as only an engineer can do, gave us such wonderful instructions on how to open these, they are new. Um, so we would encourage you to grab that. Uh, we're going to read through this next portion of Scripture. Uh, and as we do, we'll celebrate the Lord's death and resurrection. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. it says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat. You can open up the tab on the top of your cup. Because in verse 25, it says, In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us remember in the cup today. Let's pray. God, we thank you that your word calls us to remembrance. God, that it doesn't leave us in our forgetfulness, but it calls us to remember you and what you've done and what you've won and what you've accomplished for us on the cross. God, we thank you that, that we can remember that together as believers and we can be unified in what you've accomplished and what you've won for us on the cross. God, I pray that this remembrance would motivate us as we go into our lives this week, as we go into our families, as we, as we walk around this world, God, that we would do so in remembrance of you and what you've done for us. God, may that truth change and shape our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Real quick, before I send you out here, uh, just a, a couple things I wanted to make mention of. First and foremost, thank you for praying for my family. Uh, last week, if you don't know, um, our daughter had a seizure. It was, it was unexpected and, and, um, and scary. Um, and it was only by the Lord's strength that I was able to stand up and preach after that. Um, but I know that there were many people who were praying for us, and we're thankful for that. Our daughter is doing well. Um, she's recovered. In fact, she might be doing too well. So, um, But no, she really is. And it's a, it's a miracle of the Lord when people pray. Um, we believe that prayer is powerful and it's effectual and it's working, as the Bible says. Um, so thank you for that. Also, thank you for, for the opportunity of just letting me go this past week. Um, thank you, Vitaly, for stepping in and preaching. Like I say here, we have uh, a deep well to draw from in our preaching. But I was able to take off to California this past week to go to a pastor's conference, um, and I met a certain pastor there by the name of Todd Cyphers, and maybe you know him. Um, but it was a blessed time for us just to be together, to, to laugh, um, to talk about church, to be refreshed together, um, and, and it was an encouraging time for me. But I thank you to the church for just allowing us that opportunity to go um, because it has stirred and encouraged this pastor's heart and I'm ready to preach. So you better be ready for next week because I'm ready to go. But as we think about that, as we think about remembrance, let's remind ourselves of this, that we are a sent people. We're called to go and make disciples because the gospel changes everything. So you're a sent people. Go. Go.